It is always a pleasure to come back, and uh, it's, it's also, uh, for the speaker, it's also a, a test of you know how interested people are when they come for for breakfast early in the morning for someone they've actually heard once before. Uh, and so, let me share with you a few things that I think are uh, important today, and and uh, will affect our lives uh, in in the future. Uh, first. And, and I may have said this, you know, some years ago too. One of the big focuses for people at Microsoft, and I think in, in other parts of the industry, uh, are that we want to make the computer more like us. That we've grown up with computers, and largely they've been tools. And if you could master the tool, you could get it to do some pretty interesting things for you. Uh, but you still had to sort of comport with the way that the the computer worked. And uh, for many of us, you know, the, there's been a, a dream or a goal of uh, using the increasing power of the computers to be able to make them emulate the senses of humans uh, and to be able to make their interaction more natural. And I think you know, we're really beginning to approach uh, that in uh, very interesting ways now. And so the tool uh, begins to recede a little bit. I mean, it'd still be there for the people that that need specific kind of capabilities, but more and more the computer will just become a helper, an assistant, uh, and you can request help or assistance in many, many fields. I think that um, you know the way that, that this is progressing is that we've been able to, uh, a few years ago, give the computer really pretty good vision. Uh, in fact, that for us, the, the breakthrough product in this area was the Kinect sensor, uh, now about three years old, that we had for the Xbox gaming system. <clears throat> but in the last two years, we've made that available as something you could plug into a standard personal computer. We've given people development tools. And today, there's about 300 companies around the world that are now making uh, their own vision-based uh, capabilities using this very inexpensive uh, uh, camera system that you can attach to a computer. We were just in uh, Davos at the World Economic Forum and we brought some demonstrations. And two of the ones that we brought uh, uh, were from third party companies that had used this. One uh, was a uh, system that helped people do physical therapy. Uh, when I was here the last time, I talked a lot about the focus on health and computers assisting with the health problem. And, and here now, basically a, a little more than a year later, there's companies that are selling uh, products where you can take someone that ha has had a stroke, for example, or some other type of uh, physical uh, uh, debilitation, and they need to uh, be regularly worked through physical therapy. And so you can set a laptop on the table in front of you with the connect next to it. You can sit in the chair, stand in front of it. And the computer measures you know, your range of motion. It gives you tasks to do by just following pictures on the screen. And it, in fact, it provides a more reliable and certainly more economical way to do physical therapy than having a trained physical therapist come and try to guide you through these things. Because the computer can measure these things in, in free space, in real time, uh, uh, to a degree of accuracy that you know just couldn't be done before. So I think uh, another example was that we had one that had a frame that had four connects in it, and you just sort of pass through the frame, and in 30 seconds it com uh, completes a complete measurement of, of your body, and then it maps that onto the clothes that are available from that retailer, either online or in the physical brick and mortar store. Uh, everybody knows that it's oftentimes frustrating to, to find clothes that actually fit, even though they may be labeled in the size that you're nominally at. And that's because the people are all different shapes in the end, and so are the clothes. And uh, here the computer, because it, it knows basically the uh, you know the size of all the body parts. It can map that and the shape onto the clothing, and it won't present you something that wouldn't actually fit your form quite accurately. So there's going to be a lot of creativity as the computer becomes, in a sense, even better at assessing things that it can see than uh, than even people are. So I think that you know this moves us uh, toward another important problem. Uh, that every you, you hear talked about a lot these days called big data. They say, well, what is big data or what makes it big? And I think the answer is, you know, big data is 
data sets that are so large that you can't really process them in a conventional single computer system. And so uh, a few companies in the world that have been building these super scale facilities that operate the large worldwide services of the internet as a byproduct have actually also been creating these super scale computers that are able to handle incredible volumes uh, of, of data for analytical purposes. And you know, Microsoft is building those kind of things, a number of other companies are. And with that, you know, we, we uh, start to have the ability to analyze things uh, to, uh, that are just you know, really surprising in terms of, of their results. Um, this leads us to a very key technology uh, that we now call machine learning. This is another uh, technology that's been known for a while in conceptual terms, but uh, where the computers really just weren't powerful enough to do it in a large-scale, reliable way. But again, you know, the power of the individual chips is growing, and our ability to aggregate them into these uh, massive computing facilities gives us uh, now a capability to do analysis at a scale that we wouldn't have find, uh, wouldn't have found possible in the past. So. This machine learning capability is now uh, giving rise to the ability for uh, the machine literally to operate in a way that the human brain operates. Not yet at the scale, obviously, and complexity of human thought, but, uh, but we're able to start to teach it things uh, through a learning process the same way that people learn things. Uh, I think this year will go down, or 2012 will go down uh, as uh, sort of a watershed year. In, in, for me, you know, there was sort of a really good thing and a pretty really bad thing, and I'll talk a little bit more about the bad thing in a minute in, in the cybersecurity realm. But the really good thing was uh, a long dream of the computer people, has, and, and of course something that has obvious value because you can see it for years in science fiction writing and you know TV shows and movies like Star Trek or Star Wars and that's the ability to have a real-time translator essentially something that can you know listen to somebody in one language and immediately translate to another and up to this point in time only skilled humans you know who are multilingual have been able to perform that task and it's very difficult uh, in fact, quite difficult to, to do for an extended period of time and with high accuracy. And so in 2012, actually in, in 2010, Rick Rashid, who runs our research group, uh, gave the research teams at Microsoft uh, an, an objective under a, a program we have at, at Microsoft that we call our Impossible Things Initiatives. And uh, what these are are things that appear to be very desirable if they could be solved. Um, but are sort of beyond our immediate grasp, but where we actually have a strategy for them. So we don't just put any impossible thing in there. We put things in that program that, uh, that we'd like to solve, but you know, we're not quite sure exactly when you might see an, a solution emerge. And in the fall of last year, uh, a solution emerged to this, and Rick actually went to China and gave a speech in front of 1,500 students. And as he stood on the stage, uh, he wore a little microphone, a headset microphone like you would to give a speech. Except in this case, he speak in English. And less than a second later, what comes out of the, the, the speakers in the auditorium is Chinese in his own voice. So we actually ha also have a computational model of his entire vocal tract and so the computer simulation of, of the speech is actually done you know, with the right prosody and tones and in fact in his own voice, even though he doesn't speak any Chinese. So this is a, a, a real uh, watershed event. And in fact, you know, I remember in my years of coming here, well more than a decade now, that of course one of the great challenges in the EU is the diversity of language. And, and so while all of us can sit here and with some comfort, uh, you know, have this discussion in English, you know, we know that even for most Europeans, English is not their first language. 
And while they become quite skilled in it, you know, there's never it's never quite the same for most people as being able to speak freely or listen, you know, in your own language. And I think, you know, for the first time, we're approaching a time where these translators, whether they'll be, you know, in your phone or or your laptop, will in essence be the equivalent of a personal, real time you know, language translator for your speech and, and someone else's speech that, uh, that, that will be available to everyone. And the way this worked is pretty fascinating in that and, and there were two big screens and when R- Rick would speak, the first thing it would do is it understood what he was saying. It produced the, the uh, sort of the English subtitle, you know, uh, the, the literal English text of the sentences. Then it converts the English sentences to Chinese sentences in the Chinese character set. And then it synthesizes, it reads the Chinese character set in his voice with appropriate prosody. And uh, and that's how the translation works. So in fact, you're not just getting the translation, you're getting a transcription in English, a transcription in Chinese, and the output. So you say, how will this come to, p- to play in, in our society? Well, one example would be Skype or Link, you know, which are two, you know, Link is the professional video conferencing capability, and Skype, of course, now the world's most popular sort of person-to-person video conferencing on the Internet. And the way to think about this is in the future, you'll just register your language with Skype, uh, and you'll call somebody and have a Skype call, and whoever you call on the other end will have registered their preferred language. And as you speak, it just comes out the other end in their language. And when they speak, it comes back to you in your language. And suddenly, this breaks down barriers on a global basis in ways that few other inventions will probably achieve. And, uh, you know, I, in Davos, I was talking to a woman. Uh, she was Australian, but she worked in China. And her goal, uh, her, her foundation's activity was to basically educate Chinese children from a young age about environmental issues and in particular a sensitivity to water and water problems. And, uh, and she's, you know, we were doing a brainstorming exercise. She says, you know, the biggest challenge we have is that, you know, the, the way we found that is the most effective is if we can get kids in one country to talk to kids in another country. But, of course, the young kids are hampered by the language barrier. And so I explained this to her, and, you know, she was moved, you know, at, at the potential impact of this to have, you know, Australian kids or European kids, you know, just sit there through the Internet and have these conversations from the youngest ages about important societal issues or things that they wanted to understand. Um, when, he gave, when Rick gave the presentation in China, the students in the audience, many of them just started weeping because, in fact, it was a very emotional thing because while they could understand English, you know, the, the realization that, that they were looking at something that was going to facilitate this kind of conversation you know, had a profound impact on them. Now, the way that we've had this breakthrough, people have worked on this idea of neural networks, for example, for almost, well, more than 30 years. Uh, and, but we never really, uh, as we now understand it, we've never really had either enough data or big enough machines to process that data to really begin to simulate the neural training process that humans go through at a young age as they're learning language themselves. And so people had added heuristics and other things. But for 20 years, we've been stalled. Uh, We've gotten correctness in terms of translation to about an 80% correctness level. And while that's an achievement, it's not good enough to be useful in practical terms. One way to think about it is if, if, if we basically converted this meeting into a cocktail party, you know, and everybody's been to a cocktail reception, you realize that in, in the, the din of all the voices, it's hard even for you to understand the person immediately in front of you and have a reliable conversation. In that cocktail environment, a human really typically only gets about 80% 
correctness in terms of listening to what is being said. And you know what it's, you know, that can be a frustrating experience. And so if a computer every day could only do about what a human does in a cocktail reception, you realize it wouldn't be a very compelling capability. Um, but the Microsoft research people came up with a breakthrough in how to do this kind of high scale training about two years ago. We published that through our normal mechanisms and today the leading companies in the world in this machine learning field, which are probably the two leading ones are really Google and Microsoft, but there are certainly many others, uh, you know, have adopted this method and so there's been a rapid acceleration in solving problems like human speech recognition and translation. And today when uh, in the the speech that was given in China, we achieved in free speech with no training, 93% uh, accuracy, which turns out to be better than human translators typically do. And so we think, you know, we've really reached a new, new uh, uh, level of capability here and it'll be very important. Once you start to solve these kind of problems, the next thing I think you'll see emerge uh, is essentially networks of expert systems where the computer increasingly will be able to codify uh, in, in programming the knowledge and understanding of experts in many domains. And while this isn't really a form of artificial intelligence that people may still think is an ultimate goal, uh, I think for many people the internet, given this natural type of interface, may in fact seem like an intelligent system uh, insofar as that there will be very few questions that you can ask it that it won't be able to find an authoritative way to answer. And the reason is just as the internet takes literally well more than a trillion web pages and puts them at the end of your fingertips or voice through a search engine, when those things are no longer just web pages, but essentially computer systems that, that an individual organization or institution has assembled in this expert system kind of uh, uh, structure, then the internet will find them too. And so when you ask a question, it'll know all of the world's emerging uh, expert system capabilities and it'll direct you to them and you'll be able to interact with it. And so it's literally will be like having you know, the, the world's experts at your fingertips instead of just web pages at your fingertips. And, and so for many people you know, who want to solve problems, this will represent a almost um, magical access to, to stunning levels of capability. And so I don't think there's really any field of science or engineering or even business or entertainment you know, that won't ultimately be transformed through this kind of capability. Uh, with the Connect sensor now, if you have one at home, uh, you might be already doing this, but on your Xbox, we've now hooked that to, to the, the, all the entertainment feeds, both the ones that come over the top on the internet, as well as those that come through, for example, cable or satellite. And uh, we've started to make the business arrangements where the metadata that describes all of the historical programming that's available on the web or in the archives of, of uh, for example, cable TV companies is now been made available to the Bing search engine. And so Bing now has a domain uh, called entertainment. And if you sit there and ask it a question, you, know, you can say Xbox. Uh, Tom Cruise movies. And in a matter of under a second, the thing will take every Tom Cruise movie that's available through any means, you know, put them on your television, and you can just point at the one you want to watch and it'll play it for you. And so suddenly the world's video assets and movie assets, and of course these could be done for educational assets, will, will suddenly be immediately available. This educational question I think is a, a critical one for policy people, you know, in my work at Microsoft for almost 20 years, uh, we've been involved in trying to find ways to use technology to improve education. Uh, of course, many people have, have worked to do that, and we've largely failed. That, you know, uh, the kids become adept users of computers, but the computer hasn't 
largely transformed the educational process. And so every country in the world today spends a substantial part of their GDP on education and typically has a very disappointing, increasingly disappointing result. And, but for the first time uh, in my 20 years of working on this, uh, we now see the outlines of a capability that could in fact be transformational in the educational process. Uh, and these now typically go by the popular term MOOCs, M-O-O-C. Uh, that stands for Massively Online Open Courses. And uh, MOOCs have emerged over the last couple years in largely out of the United States university system. And what they are is a, is a way where uh, a teacher packages up their course material in basically typically 10 minute segments and uh, and they're they're hosted on a high scale internet platform and people just can come and subscribe to them and you say well what's the difference between that and what we've all talked about is online courses well it turns out the biggest difference is that it's not sort of a linear stream that you just sit there and, and take like it was a video version of the professor speaking. In fact, the technology monitors using this type of machine learning and analytical uh, capabilities your learning styles you know, and, and your understanding. In essence, every 10 minutes there's both new material provided and implicit testing of your understanding. And based on that, the next 10 minutes will be determined you know, differentially based on the student, their level of understanding, whether they need to accelerate or decelerate, whether they need remediation. Uh, and all of this happens without any conscious you know, activity on their part. But the other thing that's really different is the scaling. And, and one of the big problems in any type of online courseware uh, is that the, the professor still doesn't scale up. Even in universities, you know, particularly in undergraduate degrees, you find many of the courses, you know, uh, become hundreds of students, and the professor, of course, can't deal with hundreds of students in a quality way. So you get teaching assistants, and uh, and so you know that you. But even that reaches a limit, a physical limit in scaling, and. So the other thing that the MOOCs have done is recognize that the students are completely comfortable with social networking and the use of social media. And so the other thing the MOOC platform does is it harnesses social networking technology to create an environment where the students use social networking to help each other. So the, the assistance and to some extent what people always are concerned about the social element you know, of the classroom experience is now also being done through the social network activities that occur wrapped around the online delivery of these custom courses. Uh, and, and so the net effect is that a very good professor now uh, from in almost any field, but certainly all the technical fields, um, can now teach an individual semester course with uh, somewhere between 100,000 and 150,000 students at a time. And uh, with learning results that appear to match the best of those that are achieved by people who go sit in classrooms. And today, while the, these are being offered, uh, they, they're offered on a global basis. So out of 100,000 students, uh, who've taken some of these courses at Stanford and other places, you know, you find that that you know maybe 30 percent of them are in the United States, and 60 or 70 percent of them are in all other countries of the world. And oftentimes, the best performance is delivered by people who you know you would never have found any other way. In fact, uh, a Stanford professor told me he uh, taught. You know, he's a very famous person. He teaches courses in artificial intelligence, and he hosted one of these. And 150,000 students from around the world took the course. Um, and of course, they said, you know, the attrition was pretty high. Uh, only 30,000 finished the course completely. All right. And but then he pointed out that in his career of teaching at Stanford, you know, the total number of students that he's ever successfully taught. In, in his lifetime was something like you know 700 all right and 
so uh, you know, he says, so you, even though the attrition was high, it's still you know well more than an order of magnitude increase in the at per semester <laughs> to equal you know the lifetime uh, capability of them. The other thing he said was interesting. Of course, Stanford's one of the elite schools in the United States, and uh, the top Stanford student in that course, uh, you know, the one. And they did, they sort of A B these things. The top Stanford student placed 428th out of 30,000, okay, in that course. So in the world, somewhere, you know, there were 400 people who were better at that than the top person at Stanford. And it just shows, you know, the depth of talent that exists in the world out there, uh, and you know that we need to find a way to harness it. One other reason I think this is so important is not just to improve the efficiency of classical education, but I believe that for the first time in human history, we're at a point where technology is altering you know, our, our, uh, our society in, in profound ways at a rate that a high quality education is no longer going to last your lifetime that you will have no reasonable expectation that if you go and get even a four-year university education that you you know will be technologically competent enough to operate in the work environment you know for your entire working history despite you know attempts to to continue to advance in fact it's my belief right now that that people will find that they're, if they uh, are roughly 45 or 50 years old today, they're probably technologically obsolete in terms of their education versus what, you know, the way work will be done. And I think you see this, and I personally believe that this is one of the reasons that we now see structural unemployment issues with the well-educated upper middle class, uh, you know, workforces in the United States. It's why we're having, in part, a jobless, you know, recovery. Uh, business productivity is being driven forward by technological means, you know, and with fewer and fewer people. So I think we're now going to be challenged to an even greater degree to find a educational strategy that allows continuous retreading of all of our population. And of course, that'll put even greater scale demands on us because we only have at any moment about 20% of our society in schools. And now one could basically determine, well, we're going to at least have to have 40% in there at any given moment. So these super high-scale technical training programs through MOOCs may in fact be the answer to not only improve the educational quality in conventional terms, but it may be the only strategy available to deal with a population that will have to get re-educated in technical uh, foundations on a more regular basis. Some of uh, the people in my field believe that because the information technology business is evolving so rapidly that people who get an undergraduate degree in, a, in the information technology areas may find even now that their obsolescence period is less than a decade. And uh, so, you know, this, this is a big, big change, and I think people are going to have to pay attention. Two areas of uh, policy implications for this are uh, that get, are getting a lot of focus right now are in the uh, area of spectrum. You know, I've had a number of meetings here on that. We believe that it turns out the, the model by which we allocate spectrum and manage it is 101 years old this year. And the technology has changed a lot in 100 years. But the model of spectrum allocation and management has not. Uh, I part, you know, I'm one of Obama's science advisors, and we just delivered a report to him about 90 days ago that recommends ultimately a wholesale revamping of the entire model of spectrum allocation and management. And uh, as the only way that the society is going to be able to build up both capacity and mobility uh, globally to deal with a world of literally trillions of connected devices. So this is an area I encourage you to begin to dig into more. It may be some of the more important new policy work. Um, and then the other thing that's very important and we're spending a lot of time on these days is 
what's the architectural basis for guaranteeing privacy in a world where data is now being accumulated from all sources uh, and no longer in a straightforward transaction between a user and a and a processor or, or, or a consumer of a, a provider of a service. Um, this is something that I've spent personally the last four years working on since I did a report on health care for President Obama. Uh, and we now have at least the outlines of what we think is a technological basis for controlling uh, privacy. And um, and I know, you know this is obviously of importance in Europe and that the, the new uh, uh, laws and regulations are sort of under consideration now. Uh, but I think it, it, it's going to be very critical to think about how we manage this. The simple bumper sticker version that I'll leave you with is that in, in almost every case, there's no bad data. There's only bad uses of data. And so... You know, this becomes a, a difference that in implementation, I think, will turn out to be important. Historically, we've all focused, and certainly the regulations in Europe, both historically and the, those currently being planned, are very focused on the data itself. And to try to somehow control the uses based on the control of the data, either control the collection or control the retention. And it's my belief that, that ultimately... That works in concept and will fail in practice. Because at the end, people can't actually forecast what use will emerge from the data. Because it's technological advances that create the new uses. All of the things that are driving these discussions today, for example, the Facebook or Twitter problems, 10 years ago, those systems didn't exist at all. And so the idea that, that you know, you the user could be uh, expected to understand and to even forecast you know, what could be possible from the data itself and to make a determination a priori as to whether you know, he wants to provide or not provide you know, for those things, I think is a very critical question. So we favor the idea of ultimately controlling usage, not controlling data. And, but that would represent a pretty big shift in the way people think. Uh, but my forecast is I'll come back in a few years and we'll be sitting here talking about usage because that's all people can understand. Thank you. I'm happy to spend whatever time Malkin allows you know, for an interactive discussion. Thank you very much.